Good afternoon and welcome back to our tech seminar. Our next talk is about development for retro games and game jams. Samuel Yaskelainen is a furious game jammer and unpredictable traveler. He has over 100 games made so far. So please, warm welcome to Samuli. Hello, and welcome to this little talk of mine. So a couple of words of who I am first, so you know me a little bit better. So as Natasha said, I've made more than 100 games, and most of those games I made during a game jam, so I have 80 plus game jams under my belt. Uh, whenever I'm not jamming during the week, I work as a VR professional at Vario, doing high-end VR, but this talk is so away from VR as possible, so my hobby is doing retro game dev during the game jams. And this is my past experiences of making retro games during assembly game jam and some other, other jams as well. So what are the takeaways of this talk is that I want to try to demystify the development for the old platforms. So it's something that everyone can do. It's not as difficult and obscure as some people might think. Uh, I will sh sh share uh, my war stories of fighting with these old SDKs and uh, platforms. And I will go through four different platforms in this, in, in this talk, which are NES, the or original Matolaatikko, uh, the original Brick Game Boy, uh, the best console of all, Sega Mega Drive, and then the PlayStation 1 for people who want to see a little bit of uh, newer hardware, which is still very retro. And we are going to go through a chrono chronologically uh, through different kind of uh, games that I made during Game Champs. And I started my uh, retro game dev journey with the PlayStation 1, because that is why one of my favorite consoles of the childhood. And I thought it's, it would be magical to create a game for something from my childhood. At that point, I hadn't ever made anything for all the platforms. I didn't really know much. I did a little bit of searching, and I thought that PlayStation 1 would be a good platform because it was the first console ever officially support C. So I had, wouldn't have to go to make assembler, assembler coding. And uh, lucky for me, I had an original PlayStation 1, which was chip modded. So I was able to deploy the games just by burning CD, CDs and play them on the, on the hardware. Uh, oh, it's actually, yeah. And uh, uh, this kind of like uh, going through the, through the framework and the deployment method is always important when you are searching the, searching the new platform. And the first thing that I made before coming to the assembly to make a, make a PlayStation game is that I tried to do, the, of course, the Hello World to see that everything works, and then test the basic uh, output so that I get output text, put some sprites on the screen, and have some audio playing. And obviously, test also the input, the controls. And this was a really good idea to do before going into a game jam with the unknown platform to make sure that I can at least get something on the screen. And when I did this for the first PlayStation game I made, I've also done the same thing with every other retro platform that I've developed. I always make sure that I have deployment tools or, uh, and the SDKs and everything, everything ready. And now let's go a little bit deeper into the first game that I made for the, for the PlayStation, which was at the Assembly Game Jam 2016, and that was called Seekasaurus. <laughs> it's a very Assembly game. And so my platform was the modded PlayStation 1. It, it was normal stock PlayStation. The only thing is that it plays the burned, burned CDs. And obviously, you are not only deploying the game. I didn't burn like hundreds of CDs. I only burned like dozens of CDs while doing the game. So most of the time, I was testing with the emulator. And there are a couple of good PlayStation emulators. No cast PSX is this kind of development emulator which is meant for debugging. And EPSXE is one of the most supported and uh, well-known emulators, so it's good to test with, with a couple of emulators, if possible. Uh, 
As I said, I burned through many CDs because some things you really want to test on the on the on the real real hardware. And the the SDK I used was a PsyQ, and this is a. Uh, if I read correctly, it was developed originally by Naughty Dog. And it's leaked into the internet uh, at some point. And now people are using it. Most of the people who are doing uh, homebrew for the PlayStation 1 are using this, this uh, library. And it's C-based, so if you know some C, it's quite easy to get started. But one problem with that one is that because it's an official SDK and it has pretty good tools, no one has really bothered maintaining those tools to be compatible with modern Windows. So most of those tools are made for MS-DOS or something like that. And when I was reading the documentation, I lo loved the one sentence of, of, the, of the framework is that if your computer doesn't support floating point calculation, you can disable these macros to like, <laughs> get rid of the part of the SDK that might not compile on your computer. Because obviously PlayStation 1 also didn't support any floating points <laughs> calculations natively. So in retrospect, it was really difficult platform to start with because most of the tools were really cumbersome to use. Whereas in other retro platforms, people have made more modern tools and they are easier to use. Also, uh, the 3D model format was the only thing that I didn't test before the assembly. And I, uh, and I really loved the 3D look of the PlayStation 1. So obviously, I wanted to make a 3D game. So I thought, OK, I can put some Blender models in and make some, make some uh, indices and vertices out of those models. And then I can put them into file. And OK, I was able to load the, load the 3D model quite quickly. And I had my friend helping me uh, with the game. And she made the actual Sika, Sikasaurus 3D model that you will see, see later, later here. Uh, there is also a couple of screenshots in the, in the mock-up uh, disk uh, thing that I made. Uh, but the, the 3D model was not the difficult part, it was the texturing. I spent about 70% of the jam time with a friend of mine debugging how the textures work in the PlayStation 1, and in the end we couldn't actually put any textures on. So the whole game is vertex colored, and there is not much game because we spent 70% of the time trying to get the textures working. <laughs> so uh, it was a lesson learned that you need to really check all the different kind of things before the jam. Uh, technical challenges if you really don't want to uh, spend your time debugging too much. Uh, uh, Tool-wise, it was just normal C, and I was using just Notepad++ to put it. There was some build scripts, and then for the content, we were using a Blender, Photoshop, and Audacity for audio. PlayStation 1, obviously, is really good for audio because it's a CD-based uh, system, so it's easy to put some music in it, so you don't need to worry with the trackers or anything like that. You can just put whatever you want and play it, and it sounds about the same as in the, in the PC. And next, I will show a small clip of this Seekasaurus uh, uh, game. And when you are seeing it, uh, it might look a little bit confusing. So I will explain a little bit what's going on. So there is a Seeka, and there are symbols of PlayStation 1 controller around the Seeka. And it's a two-player game, and one player has to press the buttons faster than the other one to get the score. And I once brought this into the uh, IGDA game showcase with the CRT television. And I had some guy sitting in front of this for half an hour thinking it was a demo, and he was just looking at it as a demo. And he was really, really uh, surprised when I said, oh, it's actually a game, and gave him a, him a <laughs> controller. And then he spent another 10 minutes with the, with the game with his friend. So it was a very, maybe most demo scene thing that I've ever done in my life. I've never done any demos. But it was just a matter of like techniques that I had to use because I couldn't put the textures in. So I just put a lot of nice colors and music and things. Also, there was supposed to be a 2D UI, but I couldn't get the 3D model and the 2D UI render at the same time. So I just skipped the UI, so you need to calculate the score in your head. At least you get the different sound effect for who player gets the score. Uh, then let's go to the next game. So I went a little bit further back in the, in the next assembly. I went to the NES, or Famicom, like it was in Japan. And this time, I actually didn't have any deployment method. So I was only using FSEUX debugging emulator to uh, test the game. But my friend had an EverDrive uh, card where you can put the SD card, and then you can put the SD card into the, into the NES, and it works. And he tested the game after the jam. 
Uh, later, I've actually acquired this kind of card myself, so this is my uh, twin Famicom running the, running the title screen of the game. Uh, NES has like a little bit of nice tools, but you are usually just using CC65 compiler, and uh, I'm not such a low-level guy that I would enjoy doing a jam gain in an assembler. Uh, so I always try to find a way to use a higher level language when I'm doing a game jam game for these platforms. If I would be making a longer game than a game in a weekend, it might be more interesting and more valid to actually explore uh, machine language. But when you are doing a game jam game on a platform that is not that familiar with you, I highly recommend staying in a higher, higher level languages because you get a little bit more game done in that time. Uh, that there was this one, one guy, oh, there's a couple of guys, but there's one guy who has written, it's uh, Nest Daug. That guy has written a lot of tutorials for, for NES development, so I was following his C tutorials, and this is based on the one game template that we modified, so we didn't make everything from scratch. So we didn't have to worry about the scrolling techniques and other advanced advanced techniques in the, in the NES. So we were able to stand a little bit on the shoulder of giants. But it's still when you are making a game for older console. It's a game that I could do in five minutes in Unity, but it takes a weekend in in, a, in an older console. And again, it was just native C Notepad++ code, and uh, we were using Photoshop in the in the art and Fami Tracker. And whenever I'm making a Nintendo games, I always get a lot of musicians. So when I said, like, I'm making an NES game, I also got two musicians into the game, and they made so much music that I couldn't fit them into the game cartridge. So we actually had to cut half of the music off because we had too, too much music. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit shame, because that happens when you are doing games with C, it's more bloated. So if you would do things in a machine, a machine language, you could optimize it a little bit more. C will make a lot more bloated code in this old hardware, so you can't make such a big games that you might want. And next I will show, show a video of this, this game as well. And as it's called Sweethearts, it's, a, it's a, a very loving game, but it's also a very shooting game. So it's a shmup where you are flying with the naked, naked people who can combine their powers and make sensory things. And this is also a nice video that I took during the jam. Uh, it crashed. So I didn't want to show you the normal gameplay. Let's play it again. So, oh, not play it again. Uh, uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about here is not only the game, it's the, it's the crashes. Like normally when I'm making modern games, when game crashes, it's very boring. But with the old hardware, they usually just keep running. And there's this completely break, and it, it's a, always a marvelous sight to behold when the game gets slowly more corrupted and destroyed. So I really enjoy this aspect of get, getting these little clips and screenshots of the game in the broken state when I'm doing the games. And this is something that you can't really get that easily in a, in a modern, modern uh, development environments. So that was an angry mother-in-law that they had to beat in the game who's shooting Riisi Pirakas. So, next, uh, I went to the Mega Drive, uh, which, is a, which is a nice, black, perfect console. <laughs> and Critch, who is also doing the EverDrive for the NES, is also doing the EverDrive for Mega Drive. But I obviously have this Mega Drive ever drive longer because I'm a more of a more of a Sega and Sony guy than Nintendo guy, so I had all of these tools, and this image is a little bit uh, nice to show what kind of like development environments I have on my table when I make these these old games. So there you have my uh, my Ultrabook, so the screen and the laptop. Then it's then I have a uh, the EverDrive cartridge. Which, which I use an SD card, so I put the ROM into the SD card, and then I put the SD card into the, into the console. And then, obviously the console is using a SCART, and uh, Mega Drive is a nice console, that you actually get the very good quality R RPG signal from the Mega Drive, so I'm running that into the line doubler that converts it into HDMI, so I can get the modern portable display showing the game. 
because playing on a CRT is nice, but carrying a CRT into every game jam is not something that I enjoy doing because I don't have a car. And last time I called Uber to get a CRT with me, he was really angry <laughs> for some reason. Uh, there is also some uh, ways to simplify this a little bit. So this EverDrive actually has a USB port as well. So you can actually connect it directly into the computer and deploy directly into the, into the system. But as it was a game jam, and I don't want to try to learn too much new things because there is already enough to try to learn with uh, making the game, uh, I actually still haven't tested how that thing works. But I know that in theory that, that, is, that is possible. Uh, I used two emulators here, Exodus and Regen. And this was the first time that having two emulators was really important. Because the game was working differently on both of those. And only one of those were able to uh, replicate the errors that I was able to get in the hardware. So I was in a panic mode at one point when I was always just using the Exodus emulator. And I had the one issue that only encountered on the real hardware and not on the emulator. But luckily I was able to get an, another emulator, re Regen which is not the debugging emulator, but it's a general emulator. So it was better for so in that kind of bug. bug for some reason. Because the debugging emulators often have so much debugging features that they don't really mimic the hardware in a, in a perfect way. But you get more information out of them. Uh, I was using SGDK, uh, uh, which is a Chega Genesis development kit run by one, one French guy. And it's a semi-nice framework. It's not the nicest retro framework but I, that I'm used, but it's very modern. And it, for example, converts PNGs directly into the me memory in a way that Mega Drive can use them. So usually you need to use conversion tools that I will show later. But in this platform, it was very straightforward to develop those. Uh, uh, SGDK's uh, template was built on code plugs, so I just use code blocks on that because it doesn't really matter for me which IDE I use. And if there's some template already, it's better to build on top of that. Uh, for this game, we didn't have any template code. So we basically built everything from scratch. So every, only the SDK provided us was basically C wrapping around the assembler. So we could call, the, call to everything that we need from C and read the input and output and all kind of things. And again, Photoshop. Audacity and some tracker. There was uh, like uh, a, we were able to play samples that we created in Audacity, and here in Assembly Game Jam there is always a voice acting slot where people can come outside of the jam to do voice acting for the games. So we actually have voice acting in this Mega Drive game, and it was really nice that, uh, for example, the one of the characters is this business seeker. So I talked with the voice actor uh, at some point when he came to test the game, and he, was, he really wanted to see the game that he was voice acting, because the description of the voice line was that, like, uh, enjoying the food sound that comes from the mouth of Business Seeker. <laughs> so he, he was a little bit confused what kind of sound he needs to make, but it, it is a really good sound. And of course, it's obviously so, so crunched that you can't recognize who is saying what. And. Uh, like with Seekasaurus, uh, we made this nice little box, but obviously the CD is not official. <laughs> so uh, there is no way to like, make uh, games for the PlayStation that go through the copy protection without the mod chip. So we can't really distribute it in a way that other people can play it easily. But with the Mega Drive, it was possible. So what we did, I actually bought the tools after the jam to burn my old Mega Drive cards. So there's a uh, Plastic case from China, they were really, really cheap. Half of them were broken when they came up, so they were cheap for a reason. <laughs> uh, then I also got from China the plastic cart, that they use for pirated copies there, so obviously they also sell them without, without, the, without the art, so I bought a bunch of those. Then the same guy who does the EverDrive, he also makes these uh, empty, empty ROMs, where you can use this USB device to just flash the ROM into. And it's multi-flashable, so if I would want to uh, update, put like an update of the game, that would be possible. Or if I would want to uh, dump my own Mega Drive game as ROMs, that would work as well. So it's, it's a nice little tool. And then I just made a bunch of these, these little games. There is uh, uh, eight of these, I think, exist in the, in the world. And 
I've given them to some to, to people who were helping me with the game, and then uh, one is, for example, in the Finnish Museum of uh, Video Games in in uh, Tampere. It's in their collection. I don't think it's in the actual museum exhibition, but they always collect all these kind of things. So they reach me and it's like, can you give us one? I was like, obviously, yeah. <laughs> if you wanna, if you wanna wanna that, I can I can give you one. Uh, I haven't really talked about the game much. It's a, it's a cooking game, and I will show you a really short video of, of that of that cooking game next. And uh, it's extremely confusing to look at. And we have instruction manual here, but even with the instruction manual, people usually don't even know how to play it. So don't worry if you don't understand much. But there is this televisions that drop food, and then you need to try to match it with. Uh, with the desires of the customers. And what makes this really interesting is that uh, our artist actually made the background image in a Photoshop on an iPad. So half of the art here is not even done in a computer for a retro game. <laughs> so it was nice because I was just able to convert the PNG there. And obviously I had to give him the exact colors that he was able to use so we were able to convert the art. But this way is, is one way of like trying to make these retro games look more approachable for some people. This guy was also, it was his first game jam, so it was really confusing for him to make something for Mega Drive. He never made any video games. And the music in this game is absolutely amazing. I think it's the best part of the game. So sometimes it's just at home, I just put the game on and it's on the background playing the music. <laughs> yes, and let's go a little bit forward. So this is th this year, and this year at the assembly, I thought I'm going to make something for Game Boy because I got the, all the development stuff for Game Boy now. And Game Boy is a really nice platform because with the previous games, I haven't really been able to get them with me anywhere. I always have to uh, carry the whole console or some emulator. But with the Game Boy, I can just like have it on my pocket and just let ra random people play them in a bar or somewhere. And it's always a, always a ni nice thing. And this time I didn't just want to do some kind of hello world before the assembly. I really, I just, let's make some complete games to get a better hang of the, hang of the system. So I can make something a little bit more ambitious in the, in the, in the assembly. Uh, again, Mr. Critch makes the EverDrives for all the consoles. So I have an EverDrive or Game Boy. I can put the SD card in, the ROM is in. Easy, easy, easy. Uh, I like use this BGB debugging emulator, and I will show some images of this debugging emulator in action because this is the best debugging emulator to visually show other people. So I can explain a little bit what goes into thinking process. Okay, you can see a little bit of making of the game and some of the glitches that happened. I especially like the damage, damage, damage glitch where I try to type a damage when I do damage as a debug text, but then I just broke the whole game. <laughs> uh, here I was using a GPDK, uh, which is just in the same way that the Sega Mega Drive dev kit thing. This is just a wrapper, but this is even more simple low level of wrapper for all the assembly functionality in the C. And on top of that, it's a little bit buggy. So for example, I think unsigned int 16 minus calculations were broken if the uh, if the uh, value is high enough and there's some other gotchas. But I was able to make a game with it, with C, and uh, it was really nice because first time of all of these uh, uh, different platforms that I was using, uh, in this platform, when I Google errors, I actually find people talking things because Game Boy is such a popular platform. <laughs> so you can actually Google, <laughs> Google things and get some help and not just follow a couple of tutorials and forum posts. So I noticed that the Game Boy might be the best retro platform to start with making the games. It has a really good tool set and really good, really good things going on with it. And obviously we just used Photoshop on the art and this game didn't have any audio. So it's completely silent, so that's why there's no trackers or anything like that. So it was more of a like a Ludum Dare test game just to like see what I can do and I didn't have time to look into audio at all during the jam, because I was very busy making basically my own Game Boy game engine to run this game on top. 
So let's go a little bit deeper into technical things because these are fun. So this is a, a debugger open, and this is a, a VRAM debugger. And with these old games, I really enjoy because if you just open a VRAM of some Game Boy game, you can actually see everything that is in the memory and everything that can be used. So top, top uh, up there, uh, these three blocks are three different memories of Game Boy. The top one is a sprite memory, which can be used for all the sprites that are on top of the game. So they're basically the game objects that you're using. Then the middle section is the first background memory, which is usually reserved for the user interface. So in this case, it's all the alphabet and numbers and these kind of things. And then on the bottom, there is a background two uh, memory, which is usually used for all the tiles. So here you can see uh, the tiles of the, of the level that the player is on. And then you can see some black tiles on, down there, because if we go to the previous slide, you can see this hard night title screen. So the title screen actually uses more sprites or more tiles than the, uh, than the level actually even has any art. So you can see some reminder graphics hanging in the memory from the past, past scene of the game. <laughs> And uh, I've been actually thinking it would be nice to make a puzzle game where you actually have to have the VRAM viewer open uh, so I can put some things into the VRAM that people need to uh, look at while they play the game and maybe shift some registers around. Then down there uh, is another viewer. So with the Game Boy, uh, how it renders is actually your render target is bigger than the actual screen that you are seeing. So here you can see the whole render target of the arena. And then we have the screen that follows the player. So this way you can make scrolling games. Obviously, you can't have bigger than that area. So if you want to have a lot bigger game, then you need to implement some, some kind of scrolling so it generates new level and then just wraps around. Yeah, excuse me. And then the last memory thing that I wanted to show there was a the sprite memory. So Game Boy can at the same time only show so few sprites. And you can easily see all the sprites that you can draw at the same time in the game. And this is something that I enjoy with these old platforms is that if you try to think what is in uh, NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti uh, VRAM, how does it look like if you look at the graphics there directly? It's, it's a mess. But these old games, it's a little bit more human readable. So it's, it's an interesting way of like looking at these things. And uh, next I will show a little bit of this uh, little dungeon crawling game in action. And it is running on an on a actual Game Boy, and I have this Game Boy light that has a backlight, so it helps a lot in a, in a game champs, because they're usually in dark places like here. So if you are making Game Boy games, I highly recommend getting something that actually lights up, because most of the old ones don't light up. It's also really difficult to try to uh, properly capture a screen from a Game Boy game. So this is this kind of top-down uh, it's kind of like Zelda fight kind of game, but in between the arena fights, you can upgrade your weapons and uh, try, to, try to get a little bit further, and it has a little bit of a story as well. It's, it's, a, it's a nice little game. Uh, we didn't have any time to balance it, so it's either extremely difficult or super easy when you notice how to play it. So we didn't have any delay for pressing the attack button, so you can actually hold it and then everything dies. <laughs> but most people, when they play the game, they just tap it because that's how it works in every other game. So as long as they don't notice that, it's, it's a pretty difficult game. <laughs> yes. Then for, uh, I really, this was my original idea was that I, I just do this game and then I come to assembly. But I really, really enjoyed making the Game Boy game. So there was a one game jam even before this uh, assembly game jam called Isolation Jam that was in Iceland, in the middle of nowhere I was making the Game Boy game. And this time, 
I wanted to make something that scrolls. And uh, to make the scrolling, you require a little bit more code, especially with the collisions and everything. And then I found out that there is this library called ZGB, which is built on top of the GBDK. And it basically creates this nice little framework of all the basic functionality that you usually need. So you have all the time in the world to concentrate on the actual video game. And I'm more about making video games than engines, so I was really happy. Okay, here is this toolset. Let's use it. And I made one of the best games that I've ever made. Like, I've made more than 100 games, and one of the best games I've made was for Game Boy. And it was mostly because it's just a restricted uh, platform that we only had a couple of core mechanics that we were able to focus completely in. And uh, uh, the GGB was really nice, like a time saver. So it was really simple to make the game with that as well. So I didn't have to worry about the engine features that much. So I was just able to tweak the platforming physics and make the levels and do, do all kind of things. Of course, obviously, it's not similar to Unity or Game Maker or anything like that. It, you still need to go to, like a lot of things yourself, but at least, for example, the background scrolling was out of the box working for me, so I hadn't had to spend half a day doing something like that. Uh, for this game, I still didn't have audio because I'm not the audio guy myself, and I was middle middle of nowhere Iceland. I didn't have any uh, Game Boy audio guys there with me, but I did some sound effects for this game, and there's this awesome program called GB Sound, which is a program for actual Game Boy to generate sound effects on, and then you get the hexadecimal of the of the sound effect, and you can just put it in the code and play it out, play it out right. And here in the assembly, I'm now making a Game Boy game as well, and our audio guy did all the audio effects on the Game Boy itself and just gave us the, gave us the hexadecimals to put in the game. Obviously, again, here in the assembly, I got two musicians working on this because people like Nintendo trackers. <laughs> but this time, I try to make sure that we don't have too much music. So next, I will show a little, little a uh, clip of this, this game. It's a little bit better video because this time we went to a toilet to make the video because it's completely dark, so you see, see a little bit better. So yeah, playing as this little ram. So it's very traditional platformer. You have a jump and a run button. But it's something that I tweaked like a really, really long time to get the, get the feeling, feeling correct. Unfortunately, the audio is very muted in this. Game Boy, the speaker is a little bit broken, so you can't really hear it, hear it in there. Uh, then, uh, oh, so far I've been doing uh, a lot of these, talking about these different tools that I've used, but there's a couple of tools that I want to introduce that are more beginner friendly. So if there is non-coders or people who uh, want to get a lot of done uh, in, a, in a game jam, there are two very, very, very good tools. And these are really new things. Both of these came out this year. So retro game platforms have never been so approachable as they are now. So the first one is uh, NES Maker. They run recently a Kickstarter. I also packed it, but I'm still waiting my uh, physical cartridge so I can deploy the games on. But it's more of this kind of game maker for uh, original Nintendo. And how it works is it has different kind of genre modules, like a platformer or Zelda-like game or a shooter game. And those modules are written in assembler, but you don't need to modify the assembler at all. You just load the modules, and they have public interfaces to modify them to your liking. It's uh, a little bit complex in a sense that the UI itself has a lot of buttons, and as it supports multiple uh, different kind of genres, you need to read a little bit of the documentation, but it has a really approachable like a YouTube video series of something like 50 videos of explaining everything in depth, and then, of course, text documentation as well for people who like those. Uh, and I highly recommend this. I haven't had much time to look into it myself because I'm still waiting for physical cartridge in the post, post, and once I get it, I will most likely do something with this. And if I would do NES game again, I would definitely use the NES Maker. And as I said, the modules are written in assembler. They are, uh, the source code is open, so you can actually modify themselves, or you can cr create your own 
module. So for example, if you are making a platformer and you are using something like a sprite rendering module and a physics module, you can rewrite your own physics module if it's not fast enough or something for your liking. So it's, it's really nice. How the project started is that the guys were making tools to make their own Game Boy game, and then they thought, okay, maybe if we get like a one year worth of development money from Kickstarter, we can develop these tools in a way that other people can also, also use these tools. So it's really nice. The only gotcha is that it's not free. So it costs a little bit. But I'm more than happy to pay for a few bucks for a good, good tools. And then, even more simpler, is uh, Chibi Studio. Uh, if I've understood correctly, you can like, even program it on a web browser, I think, the game, if you want. So it's this, like, uh, one guy was making a Game Jam game, and he made this little framework for the Game Jam game, and then later he uh, continued developing it. It's very similar to Itchu, if, if you know Bitchu, which is uh, this kind of like a top-down uh, adventure game creation tool. So you can only make basically RPG-like world maps with this. So you can walk around, talk to people, and set flags of like true and false and, and some numbers. So it's extremely simple. And because uh, the functionality is simple, the user interface is also simple, and all the uh, drawing tools and everything are really simple. So last Ludum Dare, because I made the Game Boy game, I was searching, did anyone else make Game Boy games in the Ludum Dare? I found out that someone made uh, one uh, Ludum Dare game with the TV studio, and it was their first video game ever. <laughs> so we're at the point that the artist who can't code can make a game for Game Boy, which is, which is awesome in, in approachable ways, I think. And uh, in the future, I'm pretty sure we are going to see more platforms, retro platforms made this way, because there are people who really enjoy doing these tools for other people more than actually the games. And I'm all for that because I like to make the games more than the tools. So we are a perfect match. And uh, I want to introduce to you a couple of places where you can uh, make uh, these kind of like uh, champ games. So. Uh, every year there is a GB Jam, which is for Game Boy-like games. They don't have to run on a real Game Boy, but they can. And this is a really fun Jam. I've actually participated in this uh, like uh, five years ago or something, where I made a game that simulated Game Boy look, and I tried to make it uh, in the same way that it's, it's, it's like it could run on a game, real Game Boy. But at that, time, at that point, I didn't have enough courage to start to actually trying to make a champ game for Game Boy. Uh, obviously, if this would have been easier tools back in the day open, I might have done something like that. So, GB champ is open. Then the guy who made the GGB, uh, he's really active. He actually just did last commits yesterday. <laughs> and we tried to get them into our assembly game, and then everything break, and then we roll back. So, <laughs> don't, don't update your game engine mid, mid champ. But uh, he runs every year a champ for his engine. And it was really funny that one year his team was a sheep. And I made the sheep jumping game <laughs> later with it. So half of the games made with cheap BG is like sheep games. <laughs> sheep platformers or sheep top-down walking games or whatever. It's very, very sheepy, sheepy engine, but it's nice. He actually ran the last GB champ last weekend. So it's so recent. And then uh, there's this NestDev forum, just called NestDev, I think. They have this NestDev competition every year, and it doesn't have like a, it's the whole year. You can just pick some time from the year, but the point is that you are not making something big, you're just making a little game for that competition. And uh, at least in previous years, they've actually made like a cartridge, multi, multi, multiplayer cartridge, where you have all of these games in a single cartridge, and the people who take part into the jam can order those cartridges to themselves if they want, for the cost of the cartridge, of course. Like it's no, no, no one is. I don't think no one is taking money from it, but it's not free to make the cartridges, so I don't think they are free. But I, I think that is a nice way of doing it because uh, then everyone can pick the time where they when they want to do it. And then obviously, itch.io has the has the champ page, and from time to time there is some retro themed game champs where people also make games for retro platforms on those, on those champs. 
Uh, what about the future for me? Like, I, I like Game Boy, but uh, I've also got some other hardware, like uh, Neo Geo Pocket with the SD card reader, and I recently looked Vectrex with the, with, the, with the SD card reader. So these kind of things I will most likely develop at some point. And what I want to announce here is actually, we are after this assembly, we are going to post a little bit more information about this one, is that we are actually running a retro game jam with my friend in his hackerspace. And uh, I will bring all of my retro stuff that people want to use, and they can play around with them and make games for all platforms. So everyone, if they are inter interviewed from these uh, slides and my stories, you are welcome to come try them in two months uh, and try make games for all the platforms. It's, it's super fun. Uh, so the takeaway from here is that you can develop for all platforms, no matter your experience, there are tools for everyone. Uh, they provide really interesting challenges and interesting debugging things that you don't really uh, uh, find in a modern development. These challenges might be something that you might not want, so you, you need to pick your battles. But if you like those challenges, like I like those challenges, it's really fun. Uh, documentation is really sparse, as I said, for many of these platforms. But there are IRC servers, Twitter, and all these kind of things. You can contact people, they usually help. Uh, and for me personally, I'm a very like, young guy. I was born 1990. So making games for platforms that I grew up with is really magical, because I couldn't dream of as a kid that I could make a Mega Drive game when I was playing Mega Drive games. And I think champs are a good way of like doing this, because usually you can find uh, other people with other skill sets that they can help you with, and they have a strict deadline, so your project won't hang, hang forever somewhere. So before I go back playing Quake, uh, do you have any questions? Ah, so why many Sikas? Uh, Sika is this kind of very old assembly meme. <laughs> you will hear it here most likely at some point as well. Wait for the mic for the stream. Hello. Um, are you interested in old computers like the one in the picture to make, like for Amiga or old for 86 PCs or Power PC Macintosh, or are yeah, those I, uh, outside of your childhood dreams? <laughs> yeah, I've a little bit tackled some consoles that are outside of my childhood. I might co tackle some of the consoles. I have Commodore myself, but I've never made anything substantial for that. But it might be interesting to tackle those platforms as well. I think More we have a next, the next question yes. back there. Why don't you try to de uh, develop for the Commodore 64? Uh, as I said, I have the device, but I just haven't had the time. So I always pick a one console to make the, make the jam for. So most likely, I will do Commodore games at some point. But I most likely want to get an SD card reader for that, so I don't need to type it on the actual Commodore. <laughs> <laughs> It's not that fun. <laughs> you should join him, you know, <laughs> at the next game jam. Yes. All right. Any more comments or questions from the audience? No? All right. Thank you, Samali, so much. Thank you.